Well, we're reviewing the epistle to the Romans, what many would regard as the high watermark of the New Testament. And clearly, uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, it's not to the church of Rome, by the way, it's the epistle to the, to the Christians in Rome. And uh, it is the definitive statement of Christian doctrine. This is one reason that this epistle gets such primary treatment uh, in the course of the Institute and elsewhere. And uh, so we're in the second of three major sections. The book of Romans, the first eight chapters are about doctrine. The first three chapters are the definitive statement of, of sin in the, in the Bible. The most complete diagnosis of sin and the problems it creates. The next couple of chapters are about salvation and God's greatest problem and his greatest gift. What's God's greatest problem? How can he save sinners without violating his justice? A real dilemma. And uh, he was able to do that by the greatest gift. And I love the acronym that Hal Lindsey always uses for grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. He paid the price to make it possible for God to be uh, uh, able to impute his righteousness on us. So all that's in chapters 4 and 5. And we finally get to chapter 6, 7, and 8, sanctification. And we just finished in the previous few sessions this incredible tour de force called Romans chapter 8. And if you know nothing else about your Bible, remember the last half of chapter 8 of Romans. That's where you jump anytime you're down, anytime you're discouraged, anytime you're confused. Just jump into Romans 8 and read the last half of that chapter, and I assure you, you it, it, it's mind-blowing. But anyway, the, these eight chapters are the doctrinal part of Romans. They are now behind us. We now go into the next major section of three chapters, and that's Israel past, Israel present, and Israel future. And you'll wonder, gee, what's that got to do with us? We're New Testament Christians. What's Israel got to do with any of this? Stand by for a shock, because you're going to discover that these, these issues have two characteristics. They are of paramount interest to every one of us in this room, and they're virtually not taught by nine out of ten churches in America. Why is that? What, do you, what on earth? Well, you'll see. But we're going to, 9, 10, 11, Paul hammers away for three chapters that God is not through with Israel. They have a past. We're going to explore that, and that'll have some surprises. They have a present, and they do have a future, and we'll be very much in the middle of that one. Then the last part of the book are the practical personal notes that Paul sends to his friends. And so we'll call it faith, hope, and love in those three sections. The first one's doctrinal, the middle one we could, we could call dispensational, and the last is practical love. Real people with real problems that he deals with. About 28 of them, actually. But this is the section we're entering, a different section from the eight chapters that we've just completed, and we're on our way. Now these three chapters, 9, 10, 11, are one of the most important trilogies in the Bible. And... Uh, it's interesting, there are other trilogies that are useful to remember. There are the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. How many have heard of the Sermon on the Mount? About 30%. Okay, well, that's, yeah, that's a good start. All right. Spiritual gifts, 12, 13, and 14. And everybody has questions about tongues and gifts of the Spirit. Remember that 13 is right in the middle of that trilogy. And behold, I show you a better way. And then, of course... Second coming, there are several, but Zechariah 12, 13, 14 is perhaps the pivotal trilogy, if you will, on that subject. So trilogies are around. But uh, from Genesis chapter 12 to Acts chapter 2, the Bible is all about what subject? Israel. It's all about Israel. From chapter 12, in fact, you could say more than that, but it's certainly definitively from chapter 12 all the way to Acts 2, that's the focus. And the theme through that entire scenario is that God keeps his promises. And I want to emphasize that because right now we face an adversary that worships a God who is capricious, a God who is presented that he can do anything and does. Read that untrustworthy. 
That's in contrast to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, who delights in making and keeping his promises. They're opposites. Even in terms of just the presentation by their advocates, they're opposites. Now, by the way, we need a doctrinal as well as devotional understanding of God's Word. I read my Bible every day. Good. I hope you do. I take that for granted. But we also need in-depth exposition and we need to have a doctrinal perspective also. That's what we're into here. Now, the book of... Uh, the. Uh, the chapter 8 of Romans opened up with there is therefore no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. And it closes by saying there's no separation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's an incredible closure that we've just completed in our previous chapter. Well, here's the, here's the enigma that this leaves us with. If God is so faithful to his word that none he has justified can be condemned. Isn't that what we learned last chapter? And that none in him can be separated. Is it with me so far? Then why have the Israelites, who were sovereignly chosen by God and given unconditional promises, completely failed and been rejected? Wow. That's your, exam, that's your final exam question? Turn in your papers when you're ready. No. That's a tough one. If God is so faithful, and what he justified can be, uh, can, uh, you know, can't be condemned, none in, him, none in him can be separated, and the Israelites have been chosen in him, and given unconditional promises. We're going to emphasize that as we go here. How can they can be completely failed and then rejected? This issue that I've just posed was first posed in the study in Romans 3. Back in chapter 3, this is way back review now, Paul writes, What advantage then hath the Jew? What profit is there in circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. And what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? He raised that question back in chapter 3, and we're going to pick it up again in chapter 9 here. And one of the questions this begs is, okay, how are the Gentiles then to relate to Jews? That's a serious question for the Jew, not just the Gentile. That's, a, that's an enigma. And it was an enigma back then. If circumcision is of no value without faith, then what advantage does the Jew have? Reasonable question. Okay? That's one of the two questions that was begging uh, their attention in Acts 15, we read Acts 15, they're all arguing about what does a Gentile have to do to be saved. That's only one of two questions. If a Gentile doesn't have to become a Jew to be saved, okay, what's to become of a Jew? That's the unexpressed answer that James answers both by quoting from Amos. We'll come to that. What's the benefit of circumcision? See, this is the same question that was underlying Acts 15. And it's going to be answered, not just in Acts 15, but also in chapters 9, 10, and 11 in Romans. And it's going to impact every one of us in this room. And the issue, of course, behind all of this is a demonstration by God to the world that he does keep his promises in spite of what you may think is going on with Israel today. We need to understand that. We need to understand that to understand the daily newspaper. In Acts 15, Paul and Peter and others finally decide it's time to get to Jerusalem a couple of decades probably have gone by, and, and there's this big bruja. See, in the past, if you were interested in joining Judaism as a Gentile, you proselyted to become a Jew, and you could, and adopt all that and, and become part of the congregation. As Jews became Christians, they presumed that was the procedure. If you want to become a Christian, you become a Jew first, then you become a Christian. Because most of the early Christians obviously were Jews, right? But Paul and Peter found out in, in the field that, that it wasn't that simple. And they, they invoked this council in Jerusalem. And uh, when I did, we'll just excerpt part of it here. Put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? This is Peter talking. Paul had explained to them how Gentiles were coming to faith and were really turned on, and Peter also. And, and Peter's arguing, this is the conclusion of his argument. He said, 
Put no difference between us and them. Purifying their hearts by faith. And he's, he's scolding them, the leadership there. Why, put, why tempt God to put a yoke upon the neck of disciples which neither our fathers or we are able to bear? That's their assessment of Judaism right there. But I love the next sentence. His last sentence is a corker. In fact, it's interesting. When you see Peter in the Gospels, he's always fumbling. We say he has foot and mouth disease. You know, he, he's always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, right? Notice what happens after Acts chapter 2. He always, he is elegant, crisp, focused. We watch the Holy Spirit move. The second sermon of Peter in Acts chapter 3 is a masterpiece. From this unlearned fisherman, the Holy Spirit's moving here. Notice this last sentence, I love this. He's, he's arguing to these Jews that they don't have to make a Gentile become a Jew to be saved. He says, but we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Get the, do you get the ellipsis there? In other words, we might do as well as they do. We're supposed to be their example. You know, hurry up, there they go, we're their leaders kind of thing. And then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James, we believe was a brother or half-brother of Jesus Christ himself, uh, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as is written, After this I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Notice this middle verse. This is a quote. James is quoting from Amos chapter 9, verse 11 and 12. God speaking through Amos, and I, after this I will return. Well, to return he must have left. I will return and build again the tabernacle of who? David. David, not Levi. David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, and so on. Okay. So see, back to the thought in, in Romans 3, what advantage then hath the Jew, or what benefit, profit is there of circumcision? Paul answering his own question, rhetorical question, much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. And we're going to see that echoed yet. So now we find after that preamble, we're now jumping in Romans 9. Ready for it? That was all a warm-up. First verse, first two verses of Romans 9. Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. What's he saying here? He is pouring, Paul is pouring his heart out. He's going to say something that will shock you. He feels this more deeply than probably anything you can imagine. He says, Paul is pouring out his heart. He is talking passionately here. This is not an academic or intellectual issue. Paul's mind, he is regarded by most experts as probably the most brilliant mind that ever walked the planet Earth. And some of his logical arguments are bulletproof. They're terrific. This isn't one of them. This isn't logic here. It's passion pouring out of Paul. It's not just academic or intellectual. He is totally involved with the issue. I want you to be prepared for the statement he's about to make in the next verse. He says, it, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. You've got to be kidding. I could wish. This is the imperfect tense. That means continuous in action in past time. It's in the optative mood. You in the, we don't have that in the English, really. You know, but it's, 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 uh, it's rarely used in the New Testament, actually, also. The optative, optative mood of a verb is, is expressive of a wish that implies a contrary to fact subjunctive. Something you're wishing you know can't possibly be true. What is the, is the, as close as we can get to it in English. Something you wish but you know is impossible. By the way, the grammar here implies that that statement is impossible. Okay? This is an overlooked additional proof of what? 
your absolute eternal security. You know, in the last session, I should explain, in the last session we talked about, can you lose your salvation? You certainly can, if it depends on you. Mine doesn't. It depends on him, right? And uh, I know in whom I believe, and that he's able to keep that which I've committed against that day. And in John 10, we know that no one can take him out of my hand, no one can take it out of my father's hand, Jesus says, right? There are two hands involved, right? And as Walter Martin might say, if you can lose your salvation, I've got a new name for God. Butterfingers. And it's typical irreverent humor of Walter Martin, although I, I'm doing him an adjusted perhaps. But, um, but here's another one. This, the grammar here underscores the same thing. This event only occurs one other place in the entire Bible. But before I go there, think about it. Is there anyone you love enough to give up your eternal salvation for? I don't think so. Paul is saying, I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. <laughs> Moses said the same thing, by the way, in, Ex in Exodus 32. It came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, incomplete clause, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And he knew what he was saying. The Lord said unto Moses, Whatsoever hath, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. The Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, I will smite them with pestilence and disinherit them, and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. God is bluffing Moses here a little bit, but he's saying, you know, I'll just start over. I've had enough with these guys. But, you know, you really need to read Moses with a New York accent. I can't do accents. If I... <laughs> Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it. For thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of the land. For they have heard that thou art, that Lord art among his people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of a cloud, and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them, therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. You know, <laughs> he's trying to manipulate God. And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long suffering. And of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy, as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even, even until now. Moses is quite a guy. Gutsy guy. And one thing you know, the more you study Moses, the more you study Abraham, you realize they didn't tiptoe. They... You know, Abraham's negotiation with God and, you know, in uh, Genesis 19 is a classic. Anyway, now if this argument that Moses uses, which of course was successful, if this argument had validity before the Davidic covenant and the hundreds of other affirmations throughout the prophets, how much more now? The point that we want to glean out of all this is that God keeps his promises. If he did then... And that's despite their apostasy. Despite their apostasy. Understand that. That's going to be important. Because we're going to talk about unconditional co covenants. And they're confirmed under conditions of disobedience. Let's take a look at Ezekiel now, 36. Where God says, I scattered... 36 comes ahead of 
37, the regathering of nations in the land, and before Magog invasion in 38 and 39. Why does God regather them in the land, the dry bones thing in Ezekiel 37, and why does he protect them so miraculously in the invasion that's forthcoming in Ezekiel 38 and 39? He says so in chapter 36. It's a preamble. God says, I scattered them from among the heathen, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way, and according to their doings I judged them. And when they entered into the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, These are the people of the Lord, and are gone forth out of his land. God speaking. But I had pity for them, no. I had pity for what? I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God. Ooh, those are heavy words. Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. God's not doing it for their sake, it's for his sake. The same thing's true of your salvation. If you can lose your salvation, God will lose something more than you do. He'll lose his good name. Because he's committed to it. He's committed to you. Continues, for I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness, from all your idols, will I cleanse you. Now how will they be converted? By the Magog invasion and the succeeding events we'll talk about shortly. Let's get back to Romans 9. Pick up where we were. Verse 3 was the one we stumbled on before. Paul said, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Can you, can you feel the passion? Now he goes through and gives you ten characteristics of the Jew. He goes on to speak. Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises... Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Whew. Okay, what's that all about? Ten advantages of the Jews. Well, first of all, they received the words of God. That's pretty good for starters. That's what the first couple of verses dealt with back in Romans 3. Then we have, who are Israelites? What does that mean? Of course the Jews are Israelites. No, no. The second one, the word Israelites mean princes of God. That's what it means, princes of God. And uh, why were they chosen? As a witness of his reality, all nations on the earth had excluded all knowledge of God. But he did all this in spite of that. He called an Assyrian, an idol-worshiping Gentile by the name of Abraham, and makes him the beginning of a whole new thing. And uh, we got into that in chapter 1. I won't go through all that again here. Okay, they're Israelites, prince of God. To whom pertaineth the adoption? What is he talking about there? Well, they're adopted as sons. Deuteronomy 7. God explains their selection. He, said he selected them because they're so likable. Why are you laughing? Okay. God says, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. That's quite a sentence. That's why everybody else in the world resents them, whether they realize it or not. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn to your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, a faithful God, which keepeth the covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Okay, so we've got the adoption. And the glory. What, is, what, what does the Jew have that no one else has? The Shekinah. And we can go through all those verses about the presence of God, Holy Spirit, the pillar of fire, 
cloud by, cloud by day, fire at night, and so forth. It departs from them. It talks about in Ezekiel 9 and 10. And yet, he also has a temple covenant to return. That's Haggai 2. Many people miss that. And, we'll re and he will return through the east gate and so forth. Okay. And the covenants. Now here's another one. Now this is a full p plate here. There are four covenants that you and I as Christians have to understand. Without it, we're incomplete. We need to understand this. There are four co covenants that have a common characteristic. They are unconditional. And I realize I'm going against the traditional teachings of many churches. But let's decide right up front to see what the Word of God has to say about this. These are unconditional covenants. They're essential to your understanding of the New Testament. The Abrahamic covenant, strangely enough, is the most Jewish of them in a sense, and yet it's the most essential for you and I as Christians. And uh, it all starts in Genesis 12. The Lord said, had said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land which I will show thee. Actually, when he said that, Abraham didn't do that. He just moved up river to Haran until his dad died, but I won't go into that. God doesn't, so we won't. Stephen did, if you want to get into it in Acts 7. But the next two verses, Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3, are crucial, and I believe they're the, the umbrella that shields America from its overdue judgment. God says to Abraham, I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. We could spend the entire hour just unraveling what's here. There's more than it may seem on here. I will make of thee a great nation. Indeed he has, more than one. I will bless thee and make thy name great. There's no name under, on the planet earth that's better known to more people than Abraham. And thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, Everybody will sign up for that one, right? The next one is not too enthusiastic, but curse him that curseth thee. Whoops. God anticipated anti-Semitism. And all the families of the earth be blessed. Let's take a little closer look at these. There are seven I wills here, four direct and three understood. And from this flows God's plan for all mankind. All the other covenants build on this one. We need to understand this. I'll make thee a great nation, I'll bless thee, I'll make thy name great, thou shalt be a blessing, I'll bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Let me surprise you <coughs> with numbers 5 and 6. They are the basis for the first judgment when Christ sets up his kingdom. It, commonly called the sheep and goat judgment. It is probably one of the strangest judgments in the Bible. Why? Because the people that are before his judgment seat are mortal people that have survived the tribulation. They're not resurrected people. They are mortals. And they will be either saved or sent to hell on the basis of their works. What works? Very specific works. How do they treat Israel during the tribulation? The tribulation is going to be more difficult than anyone has the capacity to imagine. It's literally going to be twice as bad as the Nazi Holocaust. Nazi Holocaust took one Jew and three on the planet Earth. This one's going to take two out of three. There will be among the Gentiles in that day people like Eric Schindler or Corey Ten Boom who will, at the risk of their lives, shield the Jews that are being singled out by the Antichrist. They are the ones that are called sheep in this judgment. Matthew 25, the last half of the chapter, you can check it out. The ones that didn't help are called goats, and they are sent not to some temporary punishment. No, they're sent to hell. It's a very strange judgment because it's mortals judged entirely on works. Now, you can argue that the works are representative of their faith, obviously, but still, it's a strange verse. God foreknew Satan's anti-Semitism, and history has been patterned and destined after this reality in Zechariah and elsewhere. The sheep and goat judgment proves that the church will not be in the tribulation. 
It's one of the many, many places the church is conspicuous in its absence. As there'll be no distinction between Jew and Gentile of the, in, in that judgment. The brethren of Matthew 25 derives from items 5 and 6 of the Abrahamic covenant. And that covenant, by the way, all through the scripture is declared eternal, unconditional, and immutable, unchangeable. And in these shall all families of the earth be blessed. All families, that's us, gang, will be blessed through the Abrahamic covenant. God's contract is still intact. The nations are to be judged as we've just looked at. It foresees the blessing of every family on the entire earth. Galatians 3 talks about that before the throne of God in Revelation 5, 9. In Genesis 15, he, speaking of Abraham, he believed the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness and he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And then God tells Abraham to do a very bizarre thing. It was a common thing in those days, but God has Abraham go through this procedure. Take a heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And there was a procedure, if you had a really solemn contract to, to uh, signify, the two participants would set up this offering, cut them in half and put them apart, and they would walk between them together, citing the terms of their agreement. That was the, considered in those days the solemn way to, to get into a contract. And that's exactly what God has them do. The word barat, to cut a covenant, that's where it comes from, to cut a covenant. You know, we, used to, we say it in the Air Force, to cut some orders. Many people think it's because of the old mimeograph machine. No, 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 no. It actually goes a deeper root than that. To cut a covenant. And participants divide a sacrifice, and then together, they would repeat, they'd walk together repeating the terms that they'd agreed to between the things. And they, they'd divide the, the uh, thing in two parts, and then they'd walk between them reciting the, the deal. Now what God does just after it's all set up, he puts Abraham in a deep sleep. And God himself alone goes through the procedure in the form of a flame of fire. Why does he go alone? Because he's demonstrating rather dramatically it's unconditional. There's nothing Abraham has to do. There's no part for him. It's a unilateral one-way thing. He took all these, divided them in the midst, laid each piece against the other, birds he divided not. When the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove away. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said to Abraham, God says, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them and afflict them for 400 years. Shall afflict them for 400 years. Well, there's a conflict with Galatians because they were down there 430 years. Yes, he didn't see us. He's going to be there for it. He said he's going to be afflicted 400 years. 30 years they weren't afflicted. Do the math. Okay. Also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and be buried in good old age. And in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So Satan has four, gener four generations to lay down a minefield. The Rephaim, the Zumzumim, and so forth. And that's why Joshua was told to wipe out every man, woman, child of, of certain tribes. Anyway, it came to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between those pieces. That's the appearance of God. Declared eternal and unconditional. It was reconfirmed by an oath in Genesis 22. It was then reconfirmed to Isaac and to Jacob in Genesis 26. And by the way, when it's being reconfirmed, they're in acts of disobedience. They don't have to do anything. It's a one-way one street. The New Testament declares it immutable, unchangeable in Hebrews 6. That's the Abrahamic covenant. Where was Abraham in Genesis 20? He was asleep. He was not walking through these things. God himself passed through between the pieces. God's unconditional lateral commitment. And we talk about fire and purifying and uh, like on a metalsmith, how do you tell when something's finally metal? Because he sees his reflection in it, right? How does God know when he's through with you? When you reflect him, so forth. You can get through all of that. Flaming fire, Deuteronomy 4. The note, it'll be in the notes. Genesis 15 continues, the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. When people want to talk about the West Bank, say, which river did you have in mind? The Jordan, not their boundary, the Euphrates ultimately will be. 
And it goes through all the different tribes and so forth. Reconfirmed by an oath, confirmed by Isaac and Jacob, and to both of them, the promises were repeated in the original form, and you can go through all the verses if you like. And uh, it's, it, it impresses me that this recon, recommitment of it is when they were disobedient, underscoring that it's unconditional. And the New Testament declares it as such. Okay. That's one of four covenants that we want to cover here. The second one, and by the way, each of these are militantly being attacked by armed forces today. The Abrahamic covenant is what the Islam is trying to undo. To take that piece of ground and call it theirs. That leads to the Palestinian covenant. Genesis 13, Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. The men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly, and the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from, lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Not the UN, not the PLO, no, no. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then thy seed also can be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. For how long? Forever, till the UN takes over. No. Forever. That piece of ground does not belong to the UN. It does not belong to the Palestinians, whoever they are. It doesn't belong to anyone but God. And when we mess around in the Middle East with our foreign policies, we run the risk of poking our finger in the eye of God. Abraham removed his tent, came and dwelt in the land of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Okay. Palestinian covenant. Now, Due to their failure under the Mosaic Covenant, that is conditional. That's a different covenant. Worldwide dispersion was predicted under that covenant, not this one. In Deuteronomy 28, it talks about what will happen. And it doesn't say if, it says when you disobey. Interesting construction. In Leviticus 26, it, uh, it, it, especially verse 42, contrasts with the conditional Mosaic Covenant with the unconditional covenant. So the Mosaic Covenant was conditional. This one is not. Many people miss that point. They will be regathered. That's what Ezekiel 36 that we read about. And the, 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 it's, it's, they will be regathered and then be repentant. They're regathered now. They're not repentant yet. If you notice verse 36, verse 25, in the middle of that, they are being gathered before they have the Spirit of God in them. How will they then know this Lord? Because He keeps His promises despite their failures. And you and I also are not on the merit system. It also declared to be everlasting. Ezekiel 16 talks about his land, his city, and so we're going to come back to that in a minute. That brings us to perhaps the most interesting of the three. As New Testament Christians, we tend to ignore the Old Testament to our peril. The Davidic covenant is one that after tonight, I think you're going to take a lot more interest in it as you really understand what's going on there. Let's talk a little bit about the scepter of Judah. Back in Genesis 49, when Jacob was prophesying over the 12 tribes, over Judah, he says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, that word Shiloh is understood rabbinically and Talmudically and otherwise as a messianic term. The early rabbis and the Talmud authorities re recognize that term as being an allusion to the Messiah. It's a linguistic issue. Now, the Davidic covenant is generally associated with 2 Samuel 7 and 1 Chronicles 17. The kingship, the right to rule, was promised to the tribe of Judah. We just saw that in Genesis 49. So far, so good. What many people don't know, it's also hidden in the text of Genesis 38. In the Torah, in chapter 38 in the Hebrew, is encrypted the genealogy of David. Boaz, Ruth, Obed, Yishe, David. David. It's also in the book of Ruth. David is to be their king. That was predicted in the Torah. What's interesting, in Ezekiel, talking about the millennium, who's going to be the king during the millennium? Well, Jesus Christ is going to rule, yes, ultimately, but who's the king David. 
Four times it says David will be the king in that time. That's interesting. The scepter of Judah. You know, it's interesting that between 6 and 7 AD, the Roman uh, procurator, Caponius, took away the legal power of the Sanhedrin by a Roman edict that was their standard policy. They lost the ability to administer capital punishment. That's very obvious by the time you get to Christ, and they, they, they didn't have the right but by the Romans to administer capital punishment. That was taken away in 6 or 7 AD. And there's, the Talmud and Josephus record a very unusual thing that happened. When they realized that they no longer had the authority to deliver capital punishment, the, high, the, the priests and the high priest put on sackcloth and ashes and marched around the city of Jerusalem weeping that the word of God had been broken. They actually thought the word of God, because the scepter had departed from Judah and there was no Messiah. It caused panic among them. The scepter had departed from Judah. That's a matter of record. They didn't know that while they were doing that, up in Nazareth there was a young boy in a carpenter shop. They thought the word of God had failed. Let's get back to Ezekiel 37 and say, And thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and I will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. And they shall no more be two nations, neither shall be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Israel and Judah and all that business. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, neither with their detestable things, nor any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse, will cleanse them. They get gathered first, they'll cleanse later. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be what? King. Is that a resurrected David? Apparently. And be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my judgments, and observe my statutes, and do them. David, my servant, shall be king. That's a strange idea for most of us. David's actually going to rule in Jerusalem. Okay, promise the tribe of Judah. David's promised kingdom is a political kingdom. And if you don't believe that, all you have to do is look at Daniel 2, verse 44, where God says that to Nebuchadnezzar, that he's going to set up a kingdom. It's not a spiritual thing. It's a tangible, physical uh, uh, king with a dynasty and a royal line and so forth. This was all emphasized at uh, Abraham earlier. It was prophesied in advance, as I've mentioned. It was also confirmed by oath in Psalm 132, 89. It's all through the Psalms, actually, but especially Psalm 89. Now, Solomon's sons, after David comes Solomon, after Solomon and his sons, they fail. So badly, you finally get to the last of the line, Jeconiah, He's the last of David's line to sit on the throne of David. And God pronounces a blood curse on him that no more of his seed will ever prosper again. And that's in Jeremiah 22.30. A very interesting verse, because that ends it. And uh, there's a whole study on that that I encourage you to get into, um, either in our Matthew or Genesis commentary. Now, Jesus, of course, has a legal claim through Joseph, which is a descendant of Solomon, but not a bloodline with Jesus Christ. But he also had a claim through Mary because of the exception granted the, in the Torah for the daughters of Zelophehad. That's all in Numbers 27 and Josh 17, if you want to get into that. Mary was of the line of David, but not through, not through Solomon, through another son of David, Nathan. Not the prophet Nathan, but a son named Nathan. You'll find that in 2 Samuel 5 and 1 Chronicles 14. And Luke 3, verse 31, when it speaks of Joseph being the son-in-law of Heli, the word in the Greek implies a, what we would call an in-law relationship. So he, Jesus has, he's of the legal line of Joseph, but he's also the bloodline back to David through Mary. But in any case, though, Jesus, uh, the, uh, David's throne did not exist during those days. It was gone. Rome was running things. So how are we going to get around this? It's declared to be everlasting. David's covenant is everlasting. It was confirmed to Mary by Gabriel. When the child was announced to Mary, Gabriel told her that her child would sit on the throne of David. It was also recognized by the first church council. When James was quoting from Amos 9, the same essence was there. You and I pray the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. What on earth are we talking about? Well, that he might rule in his heart. No, that's not what it's talking about. That's not what it's talking about. 
Thy kingdom come. What are we praying for? You know, it's interesting. If you go back to Daniel, chapter 9, early chapter, Daniel's reading from Jeremiah. He knows that their captivity is almost over. It was destined to be 70 years, about 60 some odd have gone by. He knows it's coming to an end. What does he do about it? Put his feet on the desk, say, boy, I'm glad we're going to get through all this. No, he prayed intensely. He prayed for that result. He prayed so intensely that even in the translation, you can feel the verbs. You can hear them vibrate. We should do the same thing. Is the rapture coming? Sure. Have you prayed for it? You are to pray for that. That's God's way of enlisting you in what he's doing. The root of David is one of the titles of Christ in Revelation 5, and it's also in Hosea 3, 5. Now, let's talk a little bit about another surprise. This is all the stuff I assume is familiar to you. This is something that may surprise you. You've heard the term, the kingdom of heaven. All through the scripture, you hear the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Do you know who uses the term kingdom of heaven? Only one writer. Obviously, Jesus is speaking, but who's, who's the writer? Only one. Matthew. Mark and Luke always say kingdom of God. Matthew uses the term kingdom of heaven. Look at Mark, kingdom of God. Matthew only uses this kingdom of heaven term 33 times. And I've read a lot of books where they say, well, Matthew is just Jewish, and, and he was, being a Jew, he didn't like to use the name of God. He'd use a euphemism, Hashem, or something else, and that was just his preference. Oh, really? Some people hold that view. Good scholars hold that view. I don't happen to agree. Because Matthew also used kingdom of God five times. 33 times he uses kingdom of heaven. Only Matthew uses that term. Five times is, in many of the parallel passages, Mark and Luke's account will just say kingdom of God. Matthew says kingdom of heaven. There's even a place where he uses both. Some people say, well, that just proves they're interchangeable. Most scholars assume they're interchangeable. I don't think so. I think the word of God is pure. And I think it's very specific. He uses them together in Matthew 19. But he also, there are different views about what this means. My wife and I are going through a very serious study of this because it's impacting the pro approach we're taking in the book that we're working on, uh, that we're very excited about, by the way. But what fascinates us is the keys to the kingdom is a term used in Matthew 16. That, that's another term no one's sure about. The, the, the spiritual warfare people have their conjectures. The Catholic Church thinks it's the, they're linked to apostolic succession. There are all these contrived perceptions, who knows. The term shows up in the Old Testament only one place. In Isaiah 22, where it is identified, the keys to the kingdom is the key to the house of David. And what this, I think this is a pun. I think the key to the riddle is to understand that the key, kingdom of heaven that Matthew's talking about is the Davidic kingdom, specifically. What do I mean by that? I think the kingdom of God, obviously, is an all-inclusive God's kingdom. Any, anything, since he, when he first started creating anything, long before he created the earth, he created the angels. He created the earth long before he created the universe. The universe comes around day four. The earth's around for quite a while before then. Really? So the kingdom of God is the big one. The kingdom of heaven is a term of something more specific within that. Matthew uses it 33 times, uses kingdom of God 5, which means I think he is making a discernment the others are missing. Now, what does that mean? That's where I want to get into a little bit more. What is the kingdom of God? Well, any, it's beyond visibility, obviously. It includes the angels. He, God created them. The cherubim, etc. Satan was one of those. It began long before the earth, because the, 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 the angels shout and cheer in Job when the earth is created, we understand. It's inclusive of everything God has created. No problem there. Kingdom of heaven is physical. It has a locality. It has boundaries. It has a capital. It has a king. It has specific subjects. Mankind only. It's earthly. It's a political institution. Daniel 2.44 is one of the many references to that. It has a capital. The capital is Jerusalem. Maybe not the Jerusalem you and I know, but one that's going to replace it. It was usurped and it, by, by violence, and it's destined to be regained, according to Matthew 11, verse 12. 
These are just thoughts to stir your attention to get into this. The throne of David is going to be reestablished. That was the promise to Mary. It'll be in Jerusalem. Well, it's going to be in heaven. No, we're talking about Jerusalem. It's a tangible place. You can find a floor plan of his palace or temple in Ezekiel 40 through 48. And this was also all emphasized to Abraham. David apparently is going to rule in the millennium. That surprises me to really come to grips with. It, it shows up four times, five times, four or five times. None of this can be applied to the church for lots of reasons. The church's primary association is the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of heaven. Ooh, what does that mean? Well, one of the things that's going to be involved is the relief of the, not the elimination, but the relief at least of the curse on the creation. It's going to be a different time, and there's lots of, that's a whole study on its own right. So, okay, we've had three, let's one more, everlasting covenant. What is that? All the churches think that's to them. No, no, it's to Israel. Jeremiah 31 is to Israel. Let's take a look at it. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Really? Doesn't say anything about the church, does it? Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and they sh and, I, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Very important covenant, but it's to Israel. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and will remember their sin no more. And that's talking about Israel. Specifically. When will all this happen? Well, in Hosea 5, he says, I will go and return to my place. To return, he must, to, in order to return, he must have left it. I'll return to my place. Till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction, they shall seek me earnestly. In Zechariah 13, it talks about the troubles that they're going to face that Jeremiah calls the time of Jacob's trouble, that Michael says in Daniel 12 calls it the great tribulation. That's the one that Jesus quotes when he identifies this time of period. It shall come to pass that in all the lands of the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. Now I'll bring the third part through the fire, and we find them as silver as refined, and will try them as gold is tried, and they shall call on my name, and I will hear them, and I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. Zechariah, a third of them will be left. Tough times. And the people that help them are the ones that get rewarded in the sheep and goat judgment. Unconditional, under grace, based on God's I wills. It's an everlasting covenant all through the scripture. It includes a new heart and a new mind of all the Israelites, interestingly enough, and the restoration of the nation Israel. It applies during the millennium. Interesting time coming up here. It provides permanent forgiveness. It provides a permanent dwell indwelling of the Holy Spirit, something we associate with the church now. Universal teaching of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. National Israel will be restored to the land. God's true temple will be established in Jerusalem. That's what Ezekiel details. He even gives you, a, gives you a thickness of the walls, all the details. And there'll be global peace. Not until then, but then there will be global. Wars will cease in the millennium. Plenty of scriptures. They'll all be in your notes. We started talking about the advantages of the Jews. We talked about adoption of sons. We talked about the Shekinah. We, and uh, went through that list, if you will, back in Romans uh, uh, 3, 4, four, 5. We talked about the covenants because they're so important. That's when the reason we went into this is because if there's a critical issue that we're dealing with here, we will ultimately deal with, and that's a thing called amillennialism. Nine out of ten churches, probably, I'm guess I don't know what the actual statistics are, do not believe the millennium is serious. It's literal. It's they allegorize it. Allegorize al an allegory is a license to invent. And uh, not that there aren't allegories, but you always do your doctrine from the, you take the literal translation to interpret the allegorical ones, not the other way around. So, it's unscriptural. And it's going to be critical because so much of what we're facing in this world requires an eschatological perspective that's valid. And it's heresy 
And the her it was the heresy that led to the Holocaust in Nazi Germany, and it's that same heresy that's going to lead to the next Holocaust that we've just read about. That's why this is so important. And, uh, okay, we talked about the covenants, and there's a, there are a few more. That we're gonna, we won't go through this length. The law, the surface, the promises, the fathers, and the fact that Christ came in the flesh. There's five more advantages of being a Jew. We'll just whip through them quickly. Giving the law, of course. We went through that in Romans 7. We'd have to talk about it here. The service of God, the temple services and priesthood. And this is, this is promised to be reestablished in Haggai 2, 2 through 9. Many commentators miss that. These rituals were Israel, not the church. We're warned against them in unmistakable terms in Colossians 2, 16 and elsewhere. Let no man judge you in the meat and drink and keeping of any holy day. That's not Jewish, that's us. The special promises, the future kingdom. The fathers of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We don't have to elaborate on that. That's pretty straightforward, but that's obviously the advantage Jews have. And the final one, of course, the ultimate privilege is that the Messiah, the Redeemer himself, is Jewish. And he would come from their physical race, and that wraps it up then. Well, we're close to the end. Not bad for five verses, huh? I want you to read from the sixth verses to the end of the chapter for next time. And one, as you go... Consider, has the word of God failed? If we have all these assurances of protection, what about Israel? They've gone through some pretty dark times and going through dark times coming. If Israel was chosen, where are they now? How does this all fit together? And we're also going to encounter head on next time this strange doctrine of election and uh, fate versus free will. If it's, for, if it's prophesied, do we have a choice? Where does the sovereignty of God and the sovereignty of man tally here? And what's the difference between the body of Christ and the bride of Christ? Are they the same thing? Not so. They are different. And we'll hit all that head on in the next session. So let's stand for a closing word of prayer.